Great to see everybody. So, so yeah, great to see you. Let's frame this up. Let's have a great talk today. Framing up around the topic of digital arts and collectibles, specifically are digital art and collectibles valuable? So we're gonna break it down obviously here with John Crane, CEO of Super Rare, Roham, Roham Garagozlu, CEO and founder, co-founder of Dapper Labs, here with Deshaun Kaiser, co-founder and CEO of One of None, and here with Jerry Zhang, product manager and designer at Basic Space. Let's roll around the room real quick. Those are just brief names and titles, but let's get into it. John Crane, want to introduce yourself more properly? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, John Crane, uh, you know, big uh, digital art fan for a long time. And uh, with the launch of NFTs, I felt like there was, the, you know, this was the moment to get uh, digital art to go mainstream. So I launched Super Rare about five years ago and uh, never looked back. Roham, go for it. Yeah. Hey, everybody. CEO of Dapper Labs. Um, my crypto journey started almost a decade ago now, uh, playing around with Bitcoin. Um, but but we really started in earnest in 2017, 2018 with um, with CryptoKitties, the, the original NFT standard. And um, and right now we, we run some of the larger NFT platforms for folks like NBA, NFL and Disney. So really excited to talk about that. Welcome. Deshaun. What's up, guys? Uh, it's Deshaun Kaiser. Go by my initials, DK. It's been uh, about five years in the NFL as a quarterback before uh, a quarantine uh, business idea that got me a little excited. And uh, it started uh, back in 20, a company called One of None. And we are a platform that helps uh, brands that focus on limited edition physical drops uh, track their products into the secondary market and stay engaged with their collector beyond the point of retail. So essentially, you know, taking an NFC chip, tying it to an on-chain digital ID, and then creating these, these product profiles that allow for the brand to create a direct line of communication to their customers after the point of retail. Amazing. And Jerry? Hi, everyone. Jerry, um, PM and designer at Basic Space. Uh, we're a curated marketplace um, dealing with, like, a limited, like, physical goods and working to tie that together to, like, a one-on-one, -on -one, like, physical to digital, um, you know, goods, so... Amazing. Just a quick intro on myself, Roger Dickerman, aka RD, founder of Artifacts, digital 3D uh, sculpting, as well as 24 hours of art tracking digital art as a medium and marketplace. All right, let's get right into it. So what constitutes value? When I pull apart that word, the first place I'd like to go is to you, Roham. So we're reviewing you know, your history, going all the way back to your TEDx talk. You talk a lot about ownership. And I want to tie those two words together now. Can you go into that concept of ownership and tying it into the, to the digital context as well? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the, the TED, TEDx talk back in 2017, 2018, it was just trying to explain the concept that, you know, in the physical world, when you own something, you can take it anywhere with you, you can give it to anyone, you can sell it. And in fact, like the, the whether you keep owning it or not is more dependent on you than on, on anything else. But whereas in the digital world, we don't we, we actually don't have this concept outside of NFTs. And for us crypto people, it's sort of we forget it. But there's no way to own something on a digital platform without that. The, the record of ownership essentially sitting inside that uh, digital pl the, 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 the platform servers. And I kind of equated it to effectively um, sort of the, the old days when a, a king or a lord would basically say, hey, you own this piece of land and could take it away from you at any time. And that's effectively sort of the, the structure we have in, in the digital world. Um, whereas most of our lives are run digitally, whether it's the, the games we play or, or the fr friends and social networks we have, or in a lot of ways, you know, our journey with crypto started by at the time we were building um, products that sat inside other people's apps. So we relied on the GitHub API or the Facebook API and regularly things changing, kept breaking our applications, which hurt the user experience for our customers. And so our customers data was being held hostage by these digital digital platforms. So the concept of the ownership is basically, hey, it's my data, it's my stuff, um, and I should be able to take it anywhere uh, anywhere with you, with my, with me. And then developers should be able to build something that I can take my stuff and, and use it in their product without having to ask anyone else for, for permission. Um, an analogy that um, the, the uh, um, John Donahoe, CEO of Nike, told me is, is why he really understood Web3 was imagine if uh, someone had to ask him permission to take their Nike shoes outside the Nike store or if someone was building a street that they would have to ask Nike for permission to let Nike shoes exist on that street. That's effectively the, the, you know, the, 
the sort of the infrastructure that exists for for digital ownership outside of blockchain and, and web3 and so so when when i think about kind of nfts or or whatnot and i heard a little bit of will saying this in the last panel it's just a question of digital ownership and do we think people will own things digitally if so do we think the record of that ownership should sit in these impermanent servers or should it sit on a public uh, permanent uh, uh, record that anybody can access and build on. And, and to me, the answer is pretty obvious. It'll just take some time for the user experience and sort of the the, the emotion of it to to match the, the uh, back end reality. John, I'd love to carry that directly over to you, extending it now to digital art. Are you experiencing that same, call it an issue or an opportunity over the course of these past several years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, NFTs are really a zero to one moment and, you know, huge shout out to uh, Roham and his team for putting forward the NFT standard, um, it, you know, is game changing. And I think especially for digital art, where it was kind of relegated as this small subset of the contemporary art market and not like the value is sort of nebulous, whereas like NFTs came along, it's a very simple standard. Uh, you get, you know, ownership, you get nearly pristine provenance, um, you know, it's like a very simple, but very powerful tool uh, that, you know, has very quickly created a lot of value, you know, like it's a, it's a market expansion. I think this is just, you know, a big growing part of the art market. And um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, we're only like five years in, so it's exciting to be a part of it. Deshaun, let's go hybrid, right? I like I like that word when it comes to one of none. And it's essentially tying the physical item to a digital counterpart, but letting the digital counterpart do the dirty work in a sense. Let that transact, let that tra change hands as opposed to shipping something physical all over the place. Maybe talk about value in that context and how you see it physical related to that digital. Well, I think one thing we learned, you know, through the 2017 kind of bull market uh, was that clearly this concept of being able to, you know, quickly uh, share value and, and have, you know, instant liquidity with with your assets was something that you know the world wanted. Um, as we think about how that uh, kind of comes back to uh, the physical world, um, the 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 middlemen that are put in place, you know, take time. Uh, there's clearly holes in the model uh, with with you know counterfeits that continue to, you know, uh, power the, these resale exchanges. And um, so to create a a you know a a, a model that allows for this. Um, uh, you know, unhackable uh, uh, ledger of, of ownership to power the physical world becomes a, a, a very easy way to once again um, get that liquidity. You know, bring it, uh, make you a part of a community, um, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, enhance the, the physical world. Um, but specifically for us, you know, uh, by focusing on having that digital ownership be associated back to the original creator of the brand. You know, a creator down approach that um, can guarantee authenticity. Um, it allows for us to, to you know, make sure that that connection in the secondary market is one that brings you back to the original brand versus to you know a, a secondary uh, experience, a secondary branded experience such as a you know, StockX or a real real or goat. Um, that that layer of connectivity between the original brand and the and the resale collector we think is um, only you know afforded because of, of how blockchain is out, you know, able to you know create that that, that chronological history of, of, of you know the business uh, or the, the, the product's provenance. Deshaun, you talk about the brand. Jerry, maybe talk a bit about the individual, right? Who, who's driving that value? Talking about, let's say, a, a personal flagship or a curatorial approach to this. How do you look at that from the perspective of basic space? Yeah, for basic space, I think it's just um, kind of following like the StockX type model where like you have these products and um, so much like stocks even or like just different crypto assets, just however much demand there is and kind of like, where it appears on the news on the internet um kind of decides like how valuable something is and part of our job at basic space is to sort of like determine those things and like forecast beyond um what is currently trending to like what sort of what's new and next um and like to deshaun's point too uh we during like the bull run of like 2020 2021 we were exploring kind of tying in those physical products into um, digital like assets as well, one-to-one, -one, but saw that uh, for mass consumers who are more like Web2 natives, uh, they didn't really see the value yet. So now we're looking into ways to sort of slowly move them towards that space by, you know, like showing sort of like their purchases on their profiles, um, kind of reminiscent of like OpenSea where you can see what assets everyone, like other like users hold. Um, 
and then kind of using like Web3 eventually maybe as like a back layer to verify and authenticate all those assets. But yeah, I think as we grow, um, that sort of validity will help like generate more like demand and value for some of these more physical goods. I like that you key on it as we grow, right? Generating that validity. I think we all probably sit on the same like philosophical podium thinking, hey, this is inevitable. This is where things are trending. Maybe we can't guarantee time scale, but I think we all believe a form of this digital ownership is valuable, right? And, and will be more omnipresent as time goes. Rohan, I think you have more experience than likely all of us here dating all the way back to CryptoKitties, but you know, talking about value, okay, so we're, we're sort of waiting for this thing to be omnipresent and we're navigating all the challenges and obstacles in, in the interim. Value does have a tendency in that phase to, to swing wildly. Right. And we've seen that across many different types of digital assets. How do you how do you sit in the pocket? Right. How do you sit in the pocket as a founder and navigate those territories? Oh, well, I think that's a really good question. I can only answer from um, the perspective of our economies and, and you know, namely NBA, NFL and um, and what we're starting to do with Disney. And we've done, I think, a much better job at balancing introduction of new supply with um, either gamification or ways that of uh, of accessing that new supply um, that that old holders can essentially turn in old content uh, for. So so it's essentially giving utility to old things in a way that actually removes them from circulation, um, even as we release new content um, as we go. Whereas we didn't have this uh, concept at all in the first two three years of of our product, and we released something like 10, uh, 40 million um, and, uh, individual NFTs in NBA Top Shot alone. Um, and so, so caused somewhat of a supply um, demand kind of overhang, which, which uh, you know, in the upswing in the bull market wasn't a problem, but during the downswing got exacerbated by kind of the just just generally everybody going risk off and um, and what what impacted the rest of the ecosystem. And so, what you'll see on Top Shot today is anytime there is new content being released, there's different mechanics of accessing that content. And in fact, over the last 12 months, I believe something like 10 million top shots have been removed from circulation, even as as, uh, as new ones have been introduced. Um, and that same system is being uh, brought over to NFL all day. Um, and in fact, you know, we we we're also we're now kind of deepening the experience and, and thinking to ourselves, well, how do we give value to people um, based on just owning these assets? Because so much of the speculative period of NFTs was driven by just I'm going to buy it in order to sell it rather than I'm going to buy it in order to own it. And I'm going to enjoy it and keep it and show it off to my friends and have it be part of my social profile. So how do we lean in and make those experiences great for the people that that want that? Because, you know, the people that have been act active on, on our products, NBA Top Shot and FL All Day for the last two years, haven't been doing it to just grind and make money. Although, again, the stable economy is really important and we've invested a lot of product resources and making sure we can um, we can create a little bit more stability for for our, our communities. Um, but it's not just about the economic component. And so um, the the I think we've sort of got on a crash course in, in balancing the that supply demand dynamic that I think every big NFT project will even you know smaller NFT projects will have to wrestle with. Um, now, I say that with with sort of a little bit of reservation, because I don't think every um, digital asset needs to be a collectible, and especially when it comes to sort of independent artists and um, and and sort of the long tail. You know, I think I would love to see more and more people experiment with giving away things for free, kind of creating this this concept of hey, you're you're engaging with my application and you're earning digital assets, um, not just hey, you're buying a digital asset from me with a credit card. Um, but but of course, that's not the, you know the products we have are sort of more of the, those high end collectibles. So. Um, you know, on NBA Top Shot alone, yesterday in a in a period of five minutes, we had about thirty thousand dollars of uh, Wembenyama uh, sales. So that that sort of momentum starting to to come back, and and um, and you're starting to see the community understand, you know, the new rules of the economy, the understanding of you know how new content is released, but also sort of the scarcity dynamics, which go way beyond what exists. And and no no sort of physical trading card company makes the kind of commitments on scarcity and rarity that that we do and and of course we didn't in the early days but now i think we've gotten to a much greater point of maturity so i think i think you know swing market swings will happen but 
Um, it's important for, for, you know, we manage kind of, you know, we're, we're sort of creating these mini economies that then take on a life of their own. And so we have to make sure they're designed the right way. And um, I think we figured out a lot of the, the necessary pieces, um, at least on NBA and NFL today. And Roham, is it Wembenyama or Chet? Just to be clear. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm taking no sides in this, but, but the market seems to be favoring uh, Wembenyama right now. There was a period where there was only one Wemby listed on the marketplace for $125,000. Um, uh, the freshman gems uh, set, which just, which just dropped. So nice. um, people are, people get excited about the, the on talent, but, but Hey, as we've seen, you know, you never know things, uh, things can, can move fast. John, let's go to art. You have, you have a couple moving parts. So I like where Rohan went, where talking about, let's say, let's say high end prices versus giving something away for free versus managing primary and secondary. You're obviously dealing with primary and secondary. You're dealing with creators. You're dealing with the rare token, which which was airdrop for free based on the amount of time someone spent, the amount of transactions someone partook in. How do you juggle all those variables with this concept of, of value and balance in mind? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, there's lots of learnings and like it kind of changes. It almost changes like on a per artist basis. Um, but, you know, some of the trends we're seeing, I think we're seeing artists experimenting with both ends of the spectrum. So for example, you know, like super is well known for the, you know, kind of like high end of the market, the high value one of ones. And we're seeing a lot of artists experiment with things like bidder editions. So if you participate in an auction, you might get an addition of, you know, some of their like, you know, a larger body of work that's maybe, you know, less sought after um, than the auction you participated in. But it still brings you in and then, you know, that collector really feels like uh, part of that community. Um, I think, you know, like where we're seeing the market today, like we're still seeing a lot of traction on the kind of like the very high end, uh, you know, secondary market. I think, you know, uh, X copy is still one of the best selling artists in the secondary market. You know, that one of his pieces sold um, this week for like, you know, 250K or so. Uh, but we're also seeing huge interest from emerging artists. And so, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work um, sitting down with the creators uh, who use Super Air and really trying to figure out like, you know, what kind of tooling works best for them. Uh, well, at the same time, like, you know, I mean, like we do a lot of, I don't know, like coaching is probably not the right word, but just like talking to artists, right? Like artists are always wondering like, hey, how, what what price should I set this auction at? Or should I do a seven day timed auction? Do I, should I do like a reserve price auction? And, you know, what we've seen over the past five years is that, you know, really supply on the market is fairly important. And so you like, you really want to be thoughtful. And you also, I think there's an aspect to like keeping the collectors in the loop and kind of like setting expectations. Like there it's, it's a really, uh, you know, delicate balance. And it's, you know, it's very interesting. Like, you know, for artists, I think a lot of the early sentiment around like, you know, screw the middleman, like nobody needs galleries, like it's all decentralized. You like, people are like, oh, well, actually, like, you know, the curators and the gallerists are, you know, actually providing a ton of value, right? They're like, they're doing a lot of work, uh, you know, managing collector expectations, keeping people in the loop, uh, really helping to tell the story. And, um, but what's exciting is we're starting to see that evolve and kind of like transform into more, you know, like uh, native Web3 patterns. So, like, you know, with Super Rare, um, you know, kind of like, the decentralized gallery product spaces and just like using the rare token to kind of like allow our community to help signal value, you know, between peers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's always changing and evolving, but it's, uh, you know, moving in a very positive direction. One fun example, and you reference bitter editions, but one of my favorite examples of all time on super rare is an artist named Sam Spratt. His first three artworks, he offered a free, un unannounced, a free bidder's edition to everybody who bid on those artworks, distributed those editions. Those editions now, several years later, trade for between $100,000 and $150,000 each, uh, which I, I just find fascinating how, how value can be driven over the long haul where you're, no one's expecting it, they receive it, interest gathers around those items, and, uh, and then those goods change hands over time. Um, so good stuff, John. Yep. Just Deshaun, how are you seeing the the relationship between physical and digital and value? Are you seeing people take those items out of the vault? Do you see people primarily stay, staying in digital and, and leaning on the benefits there? 
Yeah, you know, we found, you know, really focused in on, on the, our first product was a marketplace where we leveraged that, that Baltimore model and connecting physicals to digitals. What we found there was a surprising 40% of all the products that we had on the marketplace were being stored. That's a lot higher than we ever expected. You know, we're working with traditionally Web2 brands, traditionally, you know, physical artists, analog artists to make those sales. But what we realized is that, you know, the real value of ownership only makes sense um, when there is some sort of value in the secondary market to show the ongoing, you know, royalty or ongoing, you know, uh, connection to that resale collector to really make sense. Uh, if you're thinking about high price point, you know, limited edition products like art pieces, there's not as much value in the secondary market. If you're buying a piece, you're typically putting it on your wall for anywhere from three to 10 years, or you're sending it to a vault and you're storing it and you're turning it into an asset that, you know, goes into a por portfolio that you want to hold for a couple of decades and potentially pass to your kids. Um, so where we really found our, our success more recently is less on authentication that we're built on and more on the engagement of being able to tell that ongoing story of the piece and say connected to that resale collector. So from content, whether that's from the brand itself to the user generated content that you might have as, as an owner, we can put your content onto the timeline of that piece. You know, those are the, the, the connections and, the, and the, the, you know, the features of our platform that we're really starting to find home is that really that, that digital storytelling all brought to a singular, you know, product profile for that physical good, rather than getting lost in an Instagram feed or, you know, turning it into a bunch of, you know, SMS messages or email messages to get you to join my loyalty program. By simply giving them that physical good, retailing that physical product, that already starts that story and, and then allows for that, that, that you know, brand to stop focusing on storytelling and allowing their customers to, to you know, be the story makers. Where's that storytelling going? Where do you see that taking place mostly, let's say, two, three, five years down the line? You know, and, and I don't know if we're, if we're you know, home free enough to, to get back into metaverse talk, but I really think that this concept of a multiverse, you know, having different versions of a single product becomes a, a, a really interesting concept for brands. Whether, you know, uh, you know, a true, you know, hyper re realistic metaverse comes about that, that wins or meta wins or, you know, Wilder War wins or any of those other platforms. I think that brands that are focusing on the next generation of specifically limited edition products are now starting to think about how can we allow for a single product to exist in multiple, you know, digital spaces. So whether that's, you know, you know, pixel form or, you know, block art form or, you know, a, a true, you know, CAD file, that 3D file, you know, brands are now starting to think about how can we allow that to live in multiple ways. Is. And we believe that, you know, that, that singular connected product profile that comes with it with the product becomes an easy way for, you know, a, a customer to, to find those digital avenues. I like that philosophy. Jerry, how are you seeing individuals lead here? How are you like, do you have any any fun individual case studies of how they're balancing, let's say, their primary market? Are they thinking down the line at their secondaries? I, I think for like our customers right now, not really like they're kind of just buying it to buy and to be with in the trends um we are kind of seeing like goods so we like recently got into vintage cars and like vintage furniture and seeing like all of those goods kind of resurface now and people seeing the value in them again um so kind of buying for that cause and um i guess to your point too there is still they buy because they know the value will hold and hopefully over time will increase so kind of like knowing that their investment now could possibly make returns later um, I like Deshaun's point of also seeing the story behind like the goods. I do feel like, you know, if a car was owned by someone more famous, it does drive the value up and having that uh, stored somewhere more permanently or validated by like the blockchain eventually would um, be a lot better than um, going to a buyer or going to like a seller and them telling you the story, you know, like, you can actually see it and it's all verified and authenticated. Um, but yeah. Keying in on that, again, I, I do find storytelling to be such a driver of value, right, in a, lot, in a lot of different ways. Do you have any lessons to pull over how you see people, let's say, in the vintage car line? You say you just got into vintage cars. Go into any other vertical you want. Any lessons to take out of there and apply to, let's say, these more volatile digital assets that are still in price discovery mode? Yeah, that's a. I think um, a lot of it is, and we've seen it, like, over the last few months, a lot of it is more like white glove service, us telling potential buyers like the story of why this piece is important, the history, like who the designers are, like why they were relevant. And I think with, you know, these newer pieces that may be more volatile, I think constructing some sort of like story or, you know, constructing the importance around it and showing the user why it may be valuable. Is probably the next step just because we've seen um when we were doing uh more nft launches 
people were confused on why this mattered. And I think because it's a little bit less tangible than like an actual car or furniture or clothing piece, I think it just needs that sort of like extra push to help it become um, something where like you can create the value. Guys, I, I wish we had another hour. I think I, probably every panelist has said that. I think we could just keep keep going here. I've been trying to rapid fire. I do want to pass the mic around one more time, though, to each of you. Make a final point, few few parting words. Again, this has been really enjoyable. So, Rohan, why don't we leave with you first? Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Redbeard, for, ha for having us. I think 2024 is going to be a big year. I mean, sometime in the next two years, we're going to start having uh, the killer app moments plus this sort of the the mainstream ready moment of magic that I think we've all felt years ago where, you know, digital ownership feels feels tangible. And, you know, maybe it's through devices like this. I don't know. But um, but in general, super excited to to sort of be building with everyone here. And um, and uh, if you guys haven't tried NBA Top Shot Fast Break, um, hit me up for an invite that that's kind of our, our next generation NBA experience that that we think brings that um, kind of daily engagement that I think some uh, some folks will need to get into digital assets and and these digital communities nice all right anyone else if you have the vision pro flex just make sure you line that up get it ready uh, I, I love that making an appearance we, we we love the device so yeah let's go john crane how about you uh yeah if uh you know anyone hasn't checked out super in a while um you know we've been hard at work uh during the bear market and yeah we just released a new product called uh one of one of X. So it's uh, our take on a drops feature and yeah, um, artists are loving it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really targeted for kind of like the emerging artist who's like really trying to figure out that, uh, uh, price point with larger edition drops. So, um, check it out, super.com slash releases. Amazing. Looking forward to diving in there. I see a lot of positive talk about that in the, just the past few days. Deshaun Kaiser, any parting words? Yeah, I just would like to call out a, a, a more recent drop that we just did with uh, uh, Nishi Hustle's brand, The Marathon. Uh, I think it was a, a really uh, interesting kind of multifaceted release that took something that started 10 years ago in his profit to pay program that essentially was, you know, around a mixtape that he was selling for 100 bucks and 1,000 bucks versus the tr traditional 15 bucks and turning that into a, a loyalty program. Um, so I thought that was a really cool example. We, we launched a truly, you know, a true NFT alongside it. That was a membership pass and randomly generated the whole nine. Um, but it really took, you know, a story that, that's been built for the last 10, 10 years and turned into something that's tangible today. And now from there, being able to, to you know, connect, um, you know, that, that membership to, you know, connected product releases that can now start to look at the next generation of product pay being limited edition, high price point edition goods. Got a, a couple of really cool things in store, but from animation to, you know, physical limited editions to, you know, an O to the traditional, you know, PFP era, I think that it was like all encompassing a, a really cool release that has, um, another couple, you know, years worth of roadmap um, and, and ahead of it. So take a peek at that if you get a chance. Looking forward to it. One of none. Jerry Zhang, how about you? Yeah, I think we're really excited um, as we're moving more closely into the luxury space, um, doing more like one-to-one -one digital to physical and continue to explore the metaverse. We did some work there like a few years ago, still have like everything built out, um, hoping to like come out with more of that later this year as things start to pick back up. Amazing. All right, everybody, Roham, John, Deshaun, Jerry, thank you so much. Redbeard, thanks so much for hosting us. I'm RD and uh, yeah, talk to you all soon. This has been a Redbeard Ventures production.